All right. Good morning, church. How are you? Great to see you all. It's so great to worship with church body here at Park Cities. If you're joining us online, we want to welcome you as well. Thank you for tuning in. We hope that you are blessed uh, as you encounter God's presence and, and his word. <clears throat> Uh, just a quick word, just wanted to thank you, church family, for being so supportive uh, and just being such an encouragement to, to us, to our family. Uh, Luna and I have uh, welcomed a, a baby boy about a month and a half ago, and we were just so excited for little Benjamin. Uh, he's been just a, a bundle of joy for us, and uh, man, we've just received so much support and encouragement, and we just wanted to thank you guys. It's, it was, it's just been such a great season, and we're so glad that we can share it with some of y'all. Uh, so we want to thank you. Um, wanted to pray before we begin, uh, before we dive in. So uh, can we just do that? Can we just center ourselves? Can we just quiet our souls and quiet our hearts as we encounter God's word? So pray with me. God, thank you. Thank you for all that you've done. Lord, we acknowledge your presence in, t- in this place, Lord, and in our hearts that is moving right now. God, and you have been moving in some of us throughout the week. And so, Lord, we faithfully respond to you in worship today because of the work you have already been doing. And so, Father, we ask that right now we would submit to your word. May your word leave such an impact in us that we would be compelled to act and obey all that it says. And so, Lord, today we are here to simply uh, be attentive to your spirit and to be obedient unto you. So be with us today, guide us, and it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, if you're joining us for the first time, uh, first of all, welcome, and secondly, we are in a series right now through the book of Philippians, and um, we have really been blessed to go through this book. Now, if you've been a believer for many years, if you've been at this church for many years, you've probably read the book of Philippians from front to end, and if if not, uh, boy, you're in for a treat. This has been such a great book for me, and I've read the book uh, countless, numerous amounts of times. Uh, but this particular season, it's been really great to go through it just with a fresh perspective, knowing that this is a, a new ministry season for us. And so it's been really great to go through it. And, uh, and boy, there have been really convicting messages uh, throughout this series, and it's, it really has been an encouragement. And encouragement is the word here because we've been needing that as we have started our ministry year. And there's been a lot going on. And of course, Corey mentioned uh, you know, the renovations and all the things going on. There's new ministries kicking off. I mean, it's such an exciting season right now and right here at Park Cities. Now, as it has been communicated in other messages, if there were a major theme in the book of Philippians, it would be the theme of joy, be the, the theme of joy. Joy not meaning happiness, which is oftentimes uh, based on circumstances, but more, as I call it, a state of being based on an abiding in Christ for the believer. Now, our context in the book of Philippians is that Paul is in prison, and he's writing this letter to the church in Philippi. And in our passage today, um, chapter 2, verse 19 and following, you can really sense his desire to be with this church In fact, rather than joy, I would say that the tone that you see here is longing, a longing to be with people. The joy, however, was seen more in this relationship that we see from uh, Paul that he had with two men, Timothy and Epaphroditus. So we're going to take a look at uh, these relationships. Now, essentially today, we're going to be talking about the topic of friendships, friendships. Church, what is a friend? What is a friend really? I I don't think the word has the same gravity it once had. I mean, anyone could be labeled a friend. I mean, a friend could be somebody you watch a game with. Maybe it's somebody you just walk past on the hallway, on on your way to the office. Maybe it's somebody you don't even, you don't even know their names. You just say hi to them every morning. (laughs) Maybe that's a person you would call a friend. Uh, The fact is there are nuances to friendships. Right? And it's really become this like umbrella word for all relationships that you have with people, whether they're acquaintances or truly friends or somewhere in between. Um, there, there, there is this, uh, there's this kind of ambiguity to this word. And I want to try to bring light to this, to, to understand what is a friend, but more importantly, what is a Christian friend? 
Sherry Turkle is a psychologist and professor at MIT. And she wrote a piece on this in the New York Times. And she pointed out the challenges of having a deep friendship with anyone due to technology. So much of our lives is moving online. Uh, and, and we've moved, moved most of our friendships there too. And unfortunately, that means that we have what she called the benefits of a Goldilocks effect, where you can have your friendships at the temperature you want them. Not too close, not too far, but just right. And if you wanna end things, you can do it without any repercussions from your community or even your family. So Turkle essentially advocates for the more vulnerable face-to-face -face friendship. It's vulnerable because she says, quote, when we commit to in-person friendships, we are more likely to show ourselves as we are, not as who we want to be. And this happens because our emotions are revealed, something that cannot be edited with technology. And I think emotions, among other things, are revealed in face-to-face -face vulnerable relationships that Paul described in our passage today, a real vulnerability that is seen in what many would consider deep friendships. Now, if we were to ask Paul how he would describe his relationships with Timothy and Epaphroditus, I would imagine that it would be something like friend, but based on how he talks about them, it would be something maybe more endearing, maybe more compelling. But perhaps these are the types of relationships and friendships that we should strive to have in our lives. So in our passage today, we're seeing Paul not only describe the kind of relationship that he shared with two significant people, but the kind of friendships I think we should strive to have with those we walk alongside in fellowship. This matters, church. What I say and what I'm saying today, it matters because we need each other. You might have heard that before, even here at Park Cities. But the fact is, we need each other for so many reasons. And as Paul described the kind of relationships that he's had with uh, Timothy and Epaphroditus, we essentially get a glimpse of Christian friendship and what it ultimately does. So then what kind of friendships uh, did he have with these men? Well, let's look at our passage, uh, Philippians chapter 2, verses 19 and following. So if you have your Bibles, uh, go ahead and turn there. And uh, we're gonna read the word of the Lord. Verse 19 says this, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon so that I too may be cheered by news of you. For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy's proven worth, how as a son with a father, he has served with me in the gospel. I hope therefore to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me, and I trust in the Lord that shortly I myself will come also. Amen. So I think in the relationship that Paul has with Timothy, we see a friendship of building up. See, see a relationship, a friendship of building up. Now, we've spent a considerable amount of time in 1 Timothy over the summer. Now, if you weren't with us, uh, we were in a series called The Paradox. And it was essentially designed to help us make sense of the values of the world versus the values that we have uh, as believers. Now, if you ask me, some of these paradoxes uh, on the surface seem pretty easy to decipher, but others not so much. For example, following, we talked about following in the age of leading, right? What the world might tell us about leadership may cause us to belittle and even disregard followership. I mean, how easy would it be to think this way? How about arrogance and humility? On the surface, it might be easy to decipher the one from the other, but man, in the church culture, in the Christian context, sometimes it's hard to tell. It's hard to tell if somebody's being truly humble. Maybe they're being arrogant. Maybe it's the other way. It would be very easy to mistake one for the other. Now, Paul's deeper understanding of these things served not only to instruct Timothy for his ministry, but also to build him up as a beloved brother. In fact, verse 22 would suggest that the bond was much deeper when he identified Timothy as a son. In other words, this was a discipleship relationship and a friendship of building up. 
So Paul was confident in sending Timothy to this church because he had confidence in Timothy. And, Timothy, and that's because Timothy had been built up as a disciple and sent out. Now, when Paul said that there was no one like Timothy because everyone else looks out for their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ, what Paul was doing here, I believe, was describing a value that he instilled within Timothy, a value that mattered to him and thus mattered to Timothy. This is the kind of servant that he had been built up to be. Uh, I'll give you an example. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 22 through 23 Paul says this, Paul says, to the weak I become weak that I might win the weak. I've become all things to all people that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel that I might share with them in its blessings. So so what I want you to see here is that there's a certain kind of person that Timothy became and it was Paul's joyful friendship and cultivation of building up that made that happen. Inevitably, this is the kind of relationship I believe that we are all called to be a part of in and out of the church. So let me ask you, church, does Paul's relationship with Timothy sound like a relationship that you have with someone else? Maybe someone in the church, maybe someone at work. Perhaps there's someone in your life that maybe God has been calling you to right now in this season that he's been calling you to reach out to, to pour into what has been poured into you. Can I just tell you that while you might think that Timothy is the only one being built up, I think Paul's being built up as well. For those of you in discipleship relationships, uh, however long you've been in it, you know how much you've been built up by that relationship. You know, I remember when I was challenged to disciple someone for the first time, I'd been perfectly content in receiving and benefiting from a relationship where I've been poured into by a pastor who was very intentional, uh, very loving, and very understanding. Um, I'll be straight up, I was a punk kid, you know, in the ministry. I thought I knew everything, right? But when you have somebody who knows the ministry who knows God's heart and pours it into you, you begin to see reason <laughs> and you begin to understand uh, that, that it's not just about getting the job done. It's not just about sending out all the emails you need to. It's not just about making sure that this event that you're coordinating is all ready to go and that you have X amount of people show up. No, it's about making disciples. And so with that in mind, my discipler one one day said to me, I want you to start praying about discipling someone. And I remember feeling this overwhelming feeling of unworthiness and, and worry. And I remember all the questions that went through my mind during this time, like, what if I mess it up? You know, what if I lose my disciple? What if, what if they find out that I'm not as mature as I as I put, off, put myself up to be? What if I can't do it? All sorts of doubts, all sorts of questions started to flood into my mind. Well, despite my inexperience and my inadequacies, let me tell you what happened when I, in faith, decided that I'm gonna pour into another person what's been poured into me. Three things happened. Number one, I was being built up as I was putting words to the actions that I set an example with. Yes, it's not just about saying what you believe and saying a bunch of stuff that's true, but it's also about living, living out what you believe to be true. But then when you put words to that and explain it to another person, your understanding of that deepens. The second thing that happened was I began to see the absolute priority of making disciples. We are all to make disciples of all nations. We are a part of that mission. We are a part of that ministry, every single one of us. Again, it wasn't just about coordinating the right events, making sure Sunday worship was awesome. No, it's not just about that. No, it's about making disciples and investing in people the way that you've been invested into. Number three, what happened was I developed lifelong friendships that went deeper than I ever would have imagined. And church, can I just say that ministry, because of all of that, ministry became such a joy because I was sharing life with those that I served alongside. I'm reminded of, of the verse in Proverbs 27, 17. And many of you have probably seen this before. A verse that says, iron sharpens iron and one man sharpens another. When I read this, I see 
a picture of true Christian fellowship. And the picture of what I hope to see is we commit ourselves to the building up of one another through relationships like the one that Paul had with Timothy. Now, there was another relationship that Paul describes, the one he had with Epaphroditus. And in this relationship, we see a friendship of laying down. Friendship of laying down. Let's continue in our passage, verse 25 and following. And this is the word of the Lord. I thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, and your messenger and minister to my need. For he has been longing for you all and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill near to death. But God had mercy on him and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I am the more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again and that I may be less anxious. So receive him in the Lord with all joy and honor, such men, for he nearly died for the work of Christ risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. Amen. So here we read about a man named Epaphroditus, uh, who was truly an amazing man who, uh, according to Paul, almost died for the work of Christ, truly deserving of honor. But in terms of the relationship that he had with Paul, I would say that he was more than just a friend here. He was important enough to Paul that he considered it a mercy to him when God spared Epaphroditus because of the amount of sorrow he could have suffered if he died. Now, specifics of this relationship is limited in what's revealed here, but it is clear that there was this longing for him. Church, do you see that longing? Longing for him as he was not only there for him in this time of need, but He was a selfless servant who was willing to lay down his life for the work of Christ. And Paul described this relationship and said that Epaphroditus was three things, my brother, coworker, and fellow soldier. The way Paul described Epaphroditus explains the reason why a selfless person is needed in our journey of faith. Also, why we need to be selfless for others in their journey of faith. Because our journey as believers, it will require a brother, a sister, because our life is meant to be shared. It will require a coworker because as a ministry, there is legitimately work to be done. It will also require a fellow soldier because we will face many spiritual battles, individually and also corporately. We're gonna need each other. Epaphroditus was all these things, not only because of his concern for Paul, but because of his willingness to lay down his life. But you know, church, you don't have to risk your life to lay down your life for another. You know, Pastor Jeff talked about this a couple weeks ago. We preached on humility. We looked at the earlier part of chapter two in Philippians. I wanna read for you a couple of verses that, that always root me in in this, as I continue to serve the Lord, I'm reminded of these verses frequently. Uh, Verses three and four. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. You know, when you have a true friend, there is a mentality of laying down yourself for the other, truly for the benefit of another, no other agenda but the well-being of another person. Now, I, I've been in full-time ministry now for about 18 years, uh, full-time ministry, um, in pastoral ministry, and I've been able to see great examples of laying down in humility, counting others more significant. I've seen that at Park Cities. I've seen that in almost every church that I've been a part of. Um, as I was preparing this message, I was reminded of one particular instance, however, um, I was reminded of, of a time when I was serving at a church, um, actually in the East Coast. And, um, you know, typically my, my routine on Saturday was pretty regimented at that time. Uh, Saturday was pre- a pretty busy day. Uh, I had this saying uh, that, that I share with a lot of people, which is that uh, for me, Sunday begins on Saturday. Saturday, all, my mind is just, it's just on worship. I'm, I'm thinking, we had rehearsals all, all Saturday and, you know, I'm slowing down my heart, slowing down my mind Thursday, uh, Saturday night in order to be ready. 
Uh, and, and that was my routine. Well, there was one particular Saturday where, where I was going through my routine, and my day was ending around 7 p.m., and um, I wanted to grab a quick bite to eat, and then my intent was to just go to bed early. Uh, my day started around 4 o'clock, so I was like, okay, I got to go to bed. So I was getting ready for bed, and just as I was about to hit the pillow, the phone rings. Some of you guys know sometimes that happens, um, but ministry is, uh, you know, it, 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 it happens, you know. So my, my phone rings, and on the phone on the other side was a brother, one of, my, one of the brothers that I had been mentoring at the time. His name was Peter, and uh, Peter is a pretty, pretty chill guy, pretty, uh, pretty calm and collected dude, and, uh, and so I was a little bit surprised because he, he sounded kind of frantic. He doesn't lose his composure often, and so I thought, my goodness, something's going on. And so Peter was frantic because he had been talking with a friend for the past couple of weeks uh, who had been having a really rough season. And the reason why he was frantic was because he had started talking about hurting himself physically. And it became very apparent that I needed to go. So I asked him, where are you? I'll be there. Just, just tell me where. And so off I went. A few minutes later, I got there, and what I saw were two brothers talking to one another, uh, being brothers. And this was understandably a very sensitive uh, situation, so I had to be introduced to someone who could be trusted. Church, I'll be honest, I, I feel like I didn't say much that night. I only remember seeing Peter being there for his brother. I, I was a witness to true friendship that night. What I saw that night was Peter being a brother who began to, to help this brother calm down and see reason. What I saw that night was not only a distressed brother who found a small measure of healing that led to a road to recovery, but I saw a brother who in humility counted another brother more significant than himself. And like Epaphroditus, Peter was truly a brother, a coworker, and a fellow soldier at that moment who made himself available to care for the needs of a hurting brother. I was so proud of Peter and his willingness to lay himself down to save another brother in need. And as I thought about the conversations and prayers that were lifted up that night, I was so grateful. But on the other hand, church, I was overwhelmed knowing that there are so many people who've probably felt that way but had no way of reaching out to anyone. People who are afraid of admitting that they have a problem. People who are afraid of admitting that they need help. I wanna encourage you, church. Maybe you're in that boat. If that is you today, I wanna let you know that there are people in this church willing to listen willing to spend the time and energy to be a friend who not only builds up, but is willing to lay themselves down for you. I believe that this is what our community is all about. I believe this to be true as well. Now, the friendship between Paul and Timothy was a relationship of building up, while the friendship between Paul and Epaphroditus was a relationship of laying down, but there was also an unseen person here that I think needs to be mentioned. A better friend who did and continues to do the work of building up and laying down. And that better friend is found in Jesus. You see, while Paul built Timothy up in order to be better equipped to lead and serve, Jesus sanctifies us to do this and he also makes us more like him. And while Epaphroditus risked his life and nearly died for the sake of the ministry, Jesus risked his life and indeed died on the cross for the sake of the world. The kind of friend that Jesus is to us points to a common thread that we see, not only in the relationships that Paul had with Timothy and Epaphroditus, but in the deep friendships that we ought to have within the fellowship of believers that we have here at Park Cities. And this is where I wanna encourage you to be connected, to be a part of a connect group and, and thread groups, uh, you know, any groups that will allow you to, to meet people who, is, or who are willing to build you up and even lay themselves down 
for you. So in everything I've mentioned today, I I want us to broaden the scope a bit and see that the end result of this kind of friendship isn't just doing good works for one another so we can feel good about ourselves, but ultimately, church, this is about transformation that makes us more like Christ. In other words, the best friendships transforms us into the image of Christ. You know, there was a study done by Cigna estimated that three in five Americans, that's approximately 61%, have reported that they are lonely. By the way, this study was done right as the pandemic was hitting. So I can't imagine what that number is today. I wanted to bring this up because I know how prevalent this has been in recent years. And let me just tell you, as someone who suffered from loneliness for many years, I know how hard it is to admit that you're lonely. It's very difficult. It, it, admit, it admits, and this is the, the, the thought process, is it admits weakness. It, people won't like me if I say that. I've thought that many times. The friendship is what we need, but not just any friendship, but the kind that builds up and lays down. This is what we need, the kind that ultimately transforms us. So church, let me ask you, have you been a friend like this to those closest to you? Is God putting someone on your heart right now to be a friend like this? Maybe if you were honest, you would admit that you felt lonely for a long time, that you've needed a friend for a long time. The fact is we need each other. So my question to you is who will you reach out to this week? You know, David in the Old Testament, he was a man who was often lonely and distressed as a leader and a warrior, running away from persons that were trying to kill him. You know, David knew friendship, you know, with several key men who were there to build him up and lay down their lives for him. But he also knew the kind of friendship that he had with the Lord and how foundational it was for him in his times of loneliness and trouble. You know, David, off, David often cried out in the, throughout the book of Psalms, if you've read Psalms before, and there's one particular passage that I wanna point your attention to, Psalm chapter 25, verse 14 through 18. It kind of speaks to what he is going through, but, but how he responds in light of that. Verse 14, the friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him, and he makes known to them his covenant. My eyes are ever toward the Lord, for he will pluck my feet out of the net. Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. The troubles of my heart are enlarged. Bring me out of my distresses. Consider my affliction and my trouble and forgive all my sins. Church, may we know the friendship of Christ as our eyes are turned to him. At the same time, I pray that our friendships would transform all of us into the image of Christ. Let's pray. God, we thank you for being the ultimate friend. We would like to think that our relationship is is close, that it wouldn't be described as an acquaintance or just someone I know, but a deep friendship. A friendship where you are building up and laying down and that we are laying down our lives for others because of what you've done for us. I pray, Lord Jesus, that that you would remind us of the fact that we need each other. I pray for openness. I pray for godly appointments. That has been my prayer as I was preparing this message, Lord, that out of this message, that there would be godly appointments, that there would be godly meetings, There would be convicted hearts that reach out to people, to talk to people that they had never talked to before, perhaps, or people they have known for a long time but hadn't really reached out to in that way. Lord, I pray for godly appointments in that way, for deep friendships to happen in our church, all across our campus. And as a result, may we experience joy, not just because of the company that we have, but because of the fact that we've been transformed into the image of Christ And that ongoing work is going to transform others as we inspire others to have the same types of friendships. 
God, thank you. Thank you. We look to you now. We are grateful. And it's in Jesus' name we pray.